the work I did on this book made me more and more aware of the extent to which the metaphors we employ in our daily lives, our religious communities, our public discourse, um, so often frame kind of realms of discussion in ways that we're not often not aware of, but in very powerful ways. So this applies to sin, um, you know, so uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, kind of, so, so the metaphors we employ matter. So uh, to go back to uh, uh, an example I hinted at earlier, right? Sin as debt, sin as account. Um, in my book, I mention kind of uh, the political discourse. One of the few areas uh, in our public discourse, we still regularly use the language of sin and that's with slavery. And um, related to that, sometimes it's a discussion of reparations, um, mm -hmm. right? So, so sin, we, it, we naturally talk about the sin of slavery and the discourse sometimes is framed around this issue of sin as a collective debt, right? That, uh, you know, uh, uh, that needs to be repaid. Um, so that, so, so I think being aware of that, being aware that that discussion, unlike many other areas of our public discourse, that is framed in terms of this sin as debt metaphor, it's worth considering whether, uh, you know, the application of that metaphor is a productive one. And I think I would argue in this case, it is, right? It, it is productive in the sense that um, that type of discussion, that type of framing of the issue uh, can lead to a kind of productive debate about, you know, our, our kind of collective um, uh, modern lives today, how we, how we deal with kind of the um, legacy of these issues in our society. This is very, you know, obviously a very um, contentious um, issue uh, in contemporary uh, politics and discourse. But, but so, so recognizing that there is a metaphor there in the background uh, kind of uh, yeah. make, makes us aware sure, sure. of the language we're using. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Cut out for a second. Um, yeah, and I think that that you're right that that it, when you do choose a particular metaphor, it is that you know that choice of a metaphor that can have you know really illuminating effect in terms of you know highlighting underlying uh, you know elements of a of a conversation that that aren't necessarily talked about. So specifically talking about you know the legacy of slavery through the, the lens of sin, you know we're forced to grapple with. In the same way that you know, sin often has a an effect, you know, far reaching beyond the in, initial action. But you know, I mean, especially in, in in religious tradition in the Hebrew Bible, you see, you know, the the, the sins of the parents are visited upon the, the children, right. um, and that sin is is often multi generational and is an enduring and can you know uh, have a, an effect far 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 reaching beyond the, mm -hmm. the initial action. I think that you know, really, when applied to slavery, it highlights a lot of the the really problematic aspects. I mean, obviously, of, of the act itself. But more yeah. so, how much we are still grappling with the very, very real consequences of something that happened, you know, in in the 1800s, and you, you can't mm -hmm. just say, "Oh, well, it happened 150 years ago; right. it doesn't matter," yeah. because you know we are very, very, you know, palpably grappling with, you know, the fallout of, I would say, probably the, the you know the worst sin in the history of our nation. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to offer kind of a, a counterpoint, kind of a, a, so so I would say sin as debt in the case of slavery um, mm -hmm. is, in my view, um, a productive way of talking about it. One could talk about it in other ways as well. Um, another area that that has where kind of in writing the book, um, you know, the, this um, these ideas have kind of um, connected with things I've, you know, seen in uh, modern discourse has to do with the language of purity and impurity when applied to sexuality. So that in that case, I, I would argue, I mean, I think it's less um, clear cut, anything. right? I mean, it potentially, yeah. yeah, one could very easily imagine cases where language like that um, is very can become very hurtful and damaging. So I mean, 
you know, the, um, you know, is a rape victim impure, for instance, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, recognizing the metaphors we employ, being aware of their implications, really in writing the book that it made me think really deeply about the language I mean, that is used in the Hebrew Bible, but then by implication, the language I use, the language I encounter. So really, that in terms of how the book has shaped me, that's, uh, that's above something all, that I, kind of, yeah. That's something I've been thinking a lot, a lot about recently, actually, with the, the current election, is how much the metaphor, especially, I think it's, it's worse this election cycle than it has been in previous elections that I've you know, paid close attention to, that, that this, this metaphor of uh, politics as a fight, that everything's, mm. you know, uh, yeah. you know, punch, counter punch. It's, you know, yeah. uh, you know, this, this real sort of like boxing match or, right. you, know, uh, you know, prize fight um, on the lead up to all, you know, the debate uh, that was constantly was happening. Oh, was, is, you know, is, uh, will this be the knockout punch for Hillary Clinton? <laughs> is, right. is Donald, but when you use that kind of metaphor, it does have, you know, grave implications for the way that we consider our politics. And particularly, I would say that the way that we consider people whom we, with, with whom we disagree politically. Yeah. That if right. all of a sudden this is not just you know a political disagreement, but this is a battle, and there is only one winner and there's only one loser, and right. it's a totally zero sum game. Yeah, uh, like I, I think that that metaphor that is increasingly applied um, is part of the reason why we've reached a, a stage in, in our political processing that is largely defined by uh, paralysis and by you know just vitriol and complete disdain with uh, for people with whom we disagree. Yeah, I mean, that's a really perceptive um, kind of observation about kind of what's going on right now. Um, and so really, I mean, the, this, the, the kinds of um, implications for uh, kind of how we think about uh, you know, all areas of our public discourse, uh, you know, recognizing kind of the powers of uh, the power of these metaphors, again, the way they frame the discussion in, in ways that are implicit, right? Um, often it just comes through in kind of even just the way a headline it, it shows up, but that's all you need, right? Um, just the other thing that comes out of this book is once that metaphor is there, kind of often what follows is interpreted, read, understood in light of that initial framing. So, yeah, very much. It, it, this is, um, you know, I, I think about this stuff all the time, uh, you know, maybe yeah, too much, yeah. Uh, but yeah.